or not. Um, also, since this is being live streamed, welcome to all our listeners there as well. I'm Teja Kulkarni. I'm an associate professor and director of the Interstitial Lung Disease Program at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Um, I'll let um, our other panelists introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Dan Dilling. I'm, uh, I work in interstitial lung disease as well at Loyola University of Chicago. I'm Stephen Hobbs. I'm a chest radiologist from the University of Kentucky. Mary Beth Sholin. I work in interstitial lung disease at University of Utah. I'm Tracy Lucart. I'm in interstitial lung disease at UAB, and I'm standing in for our pathologist this morning. So. <laughs> Sorry, we've had an emergency there. Here are our disclosures. I'll leave it on for a second here. Right, so um, our learning objectives today are to experience a real-world multidisciplinary discussion for the diagnosis of ILD, to understand what a comprehensive evaluation of patients with suspected ILD is to enhance early diagnosis, to recognize the common patterns of HRCT scans um, in the context of ILD diagnosis, and then finally to understand pulmonary histopathology in ILD. Um, in May 2022, new guidelines for the diagnosis of um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis um, were published. And um, this is the treatment algorithm that was um, recommended for a patient where you suspect IPF. So a patient who um, has symptoms that they present with um, dyspnea and cough and, um, you know, how do you work them up and look for potential causes. And then you look at the CT patterns to determine whether um, you know, whether it's consistent with IPF or not, um, go through a multidisciplinary discussion, which has been highlighted. It's very important. We've, um, there have been multiple publications which have um, shown the importance of an MDD in the diagnosis of any ILD. Um, and then there's additional discussion on trans transbronchial lung cryobiopsy um, versus surgical lung biopsy, as well as genomic classifier. Um, and finally, whether pathology and our surgical lung biopsy was needed um, for the final diagnosis of IPF or other ILDs. So with that, we'll go to our first case. So we have a 68-year-old Caucasian male who was referred um, to the chest X-ray was concerning for pulmonary fibrosis. He has progressive dyspnea with severe exertion for the last eight to 10 months, remains active, has continued to work, um, has moderate non-productive cough, which is bothersome, does um, report early graying of hair in the early 30s, denies any uh, reflux symptoms, uh, symptoms suggestive of autoimmune, which is joint pain, skin rashes, sick of symptoms, um, hair loss, muscle weakness, or other neurological symptoms, no chest pain, or lower extremity edema. With um, other histories, has a history of hypertension, um, no surgical history, is on metoprolol. Um, he is a former smoker, quit at the age of 60, has a 50-pack year smoking history, um, occasional alcohol use, um, when, when asked about family history, father maybe had some scarring, was told he had COPD. Sister has a history of rheumatoid arthritis. With occupational exposures, he was a construction worker for about 10 years and then um, mostly has been in a managerial role after that. No other environmental exposures, include, including mold or mildew, no feather bedding or pet birds, humid, no humidifier, no hot tub or jacuzzi use, and no other medication exposures. On exam, really, you know, most of it was benign. He did have some bilateral lower lung field dry crackles, but um, skin was okay. The joints had normal range of motion, um, no tenderness or swelling, no deformities, no skin rashes. Um, GI neurological exam, fairly benign. He, um, his saturation was 96% at rest. This is his pulmonary function test. His FEC was 91% ratio of 75%, uh, total lung capacity 73%, and DLCO 73% as well. And here's the HRCT. Thank you. So now my favorite part. Um, so let's take a look at the movie, and I'll let you guys take a look at it as we're going through. So the first key component here, um, this is an HRCT. We've done inspiratory 
uh, views here, and we'll probably uh, complement that with expiratory views right after this. And what we see is a diffuse lung abnormality. And you notice as we go from towards the head down towards the lung bases, the amount of abnormality increases. So it's a lower lung predominant process. It is overall peripheral predominant. There's a good bit of reticulation in the subpleural lungs and the peripheral lungs. And along with that reticulation, architectural distortion where we've uh, kind of distorted the secondary pulmonary lobules. So we absolutely have fibrosis here characterized by that reticulation and that lower lung predominance and that peripheral predominance. There isn't any definite honeycomb cyst formation. There could be some honeycomb cyst formation up here at the lung apices, or maybe that's just a little bit of emphysema and scarring up here too. Um, so if I'm looking at this, I'm already thinking, okay, I've got a diffuse lung abnormality that's clearly fibrotic, peripheral lower lung predominant reticular abnormality, without probably honeycomb cyst formation, maybe honeycomb cyst formation. So I'm thinking of a probable UIP pattern just looking off of this. And because we're gonna do a complete exam, right, on these initials, uh, HRCTs, we wanna include inspiratories and expiratories for these to look for any evidence of small airways disease that might point us in a different direction. On expiratory, it looks relatively similar. We're not seeing a lot of expiratory air trapping here. There is some uh, differential attenuation down here in the lower lungs and mild amounts of air trapping, even uh, in a probable UIP pattern, is okay. So don't let that dissuade you from necessarily characterize something as a UIP pattern or a probable UIP pattern based on relatively mild amounts of air trapping. So having looked at the inspiratories and looked at the expiratories, Highlighting that again, I switched back, right? This is that mild uh, amount of differential attenuation down here in the lower lungs. That's uh, all in keeping with a probable UIP pattern uh, is how I would characterize this. So that being said, my reports, right? I would specifically call that out, call it probable UIP pattern and say by the ATS guidelines. In the case of the ATS or the, like the Fleischer Society guidelines, it's essentially identical, so I don't really have to make that uh, distinction, but I specifically call that out as a possibility in that pattern. Thank you, Steve. So um, moving forward, the next work set of workup, we have the CT scan. The other part of the workup that is really important um, for any ILD patient is to get serologies. In this patient, um, the serologies, as you can see, was negative. So with that, um, let's go to our first question here. If you can um, pull up your app and answer this question for me. Would you recommend a surgical lung biopsy for this patient, yes or no? And that would be correct. So uh, majority of you answered no. Um, the, um, if we look at all the clinical features put together, we wouldn't recommend a surgical lung biopsy. Okay. Dr. Dilling, can you um, go over the case for us and um, explain why we wouldn't get a surgical lung biopsy for this patient? Okay, so I think you, you hearken back to the diagram that we thought about, uh, that we looked at earlier from the ATS guidelines. And this is somebody in whom we've uh, um, e uh, evaluated for other possibilities for an ILD, meaning um, looked for hobbies and occupations and things that you know might be suspicious, and uh, and the serologies as well, and, and really there doesn't seem to be any autoimmune signal and no suspicious exposures. So now we have someone with a probable UIP pattern and and uh, uh, mild symptoms, and I, I would say this is. Uh, fits that criterion to go down to the IPF diagnosis. So I think we'll talk about it a little bit here in, in our ILD MDD, but um, I don't know, do you have any additional thoughts? I mean, differ, um, differing thoughts, I should say? No, not about the di I mean, we might talk about other things we can do for this gentleman based on some of his history, but I would feel comfortable calling this IPF at this point, given his age group, his history, and his CT scan without a biopsy, absolutely. 
Could you comment, Dr. Sholand, on like why the guidelines, you know, the, the major change from the 2018 guidelines to 2022 guidelines was to include probable UIP where, into, uh, where we don't need a surgical lung biopsy if all else fits. Can you discuss a little bit about that? Or? So sure, I mean, so this, this is really derived from data that tells us that in the right demographic group, i.e. a male with a history of smoking, a male over the age of 60 with a history of smoking, with a probable UIP pattern, that this will end up being uh, uh, UIP by uh, pathology uh, you know, most of the time, so such so much so that we don't need to pursue a biopsy to, to show that again. So, you know, as a, and, and if we don't see any red, you know, flags in his history that would tell us we should be thinking about something else, i.e. we talked about the um, autoimmune serology, so we don't see anything there. We don't, we did a good rheumatologic evaluation. We don't see anything clinically that makes us suspect an autoimmune disease. And then his occupational history, the other part of that um, algorithm is saying that there's no known uh, alternate etiology or no known exposure. So although he had, I mean, he clearly had some, you know, VGDF, vapors, gas, dust, fume exposure in his work as a, as a uh, um, construction worker, although those might be a risk factor for IPF, they're not an independent, separate diagnosis category such that we would think he has a different disease. Um, we can talk a little bit about his family in a minute, but, uh, but beyond that, I think um, I would be comfortable calling it IPF. Thank you so much. For, uh, my question is for Dr. Hobbs. Mm -hmm. This is uh, Javon Andrade of at, at Nashville. So uh, you made an important point that the minor amount of air trapping doesn't move the patient away from UIP or probably UIP to consistent with something else. Mm -hmm. So as you're looking at these cases, when does that threshold cross us for you? Oh, yeah, so yeah. probably different for everybody, <laughs> yeah. right? So uh, the uh, uh, informal answer be uh, whenever I feel like it uh, mm -hmm. is enough to, to put me in a other uh, category. Um, a more formal answer would be when there's significant air trapping, whatever significant air trapping means, and at least like three lobes, okay. right? So it has to be uh, out of proportion, really, in my opinion, to the amount of fibrosis, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm seeing relatively minor amounts of air trapping, especially in those areas where there's reticular abnormality or bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis, then I'm probably going to discount most of that, right? I really want to be seeing air trapping, uh, ideally even in relatively normal looking areas of lung uh, or in association with other features that suggest a more diffuse parenchymal infiltration like ground glass or something like that. But to your point, on the radiology side of stuff, we're not great at defining exactly what counts uh, as far as you know significant amounts of air trapping that should point us towards an alternative diagnosis. Thank I think you. that's a really good question. And one example, one, two, two thoughts. One example of why the MDD is so important so that you, you know, discuss right there with your radiologist. Because I'll often see that on a reporter. Many of us will. And if we don't get into the same room with the radiologist, yeah. it'll dissuade me. Yeah. And, oh, I mean, you shouldn't decide this is IPF. There's features inconsistent with, mm -hmm. but the radiologist calls it all the time. Is it true that it is actually can be a normal variant, or is that not yeah. true? Right. So you can, right? So upwards of 30 percent of patients will have some degree of air trapping on expiration if you just, you know, scan them uh, all comers, right? So it, it is, you know, uh, in that sense, a potential normal variant. So you have to be careful about like the significance of overcalling that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the interactive process, I mean, that's the, the point you're making very bad is that it, it is an interactive process, so the impression of the clinician can sometimes impress the radiologist to move a little bit one way or another, and vice versa, right? Yeah. So, that's, so that's the, in, the, in typical radiology the form, I'll, like, if there is some degree of air trapping on expiration, and I don't want to push people to start thinking about, you know, a small airways disease process, then I'll call it heterogeneous emptying <laughs> instead, right? <laughs> so that that keyword isn't crafty. like pushing very them crafty. in the wrong direction, right? Somebody did that at some point in time in my training and I liked it and now I stuck with it. So uh, <laughs> there's no evidence for that uh, to be clear. Um, but if I see, oh, that's what I'm referring to when I, I see that type Super. of thing. I would say in the era of patients reading their own records, yeah. <laughs> I get the most calls about what air trapping means and then my favorite is what ground, Brown glass. How do I have glass in my lungs, doctor? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be a good one. Uh, I, think, I think this question and answer, though, also really highlights how important it is to have both a good 
imaging study done, the proper kind of imaging study done, meaning not that PE study that uh, sort of uncovered the ILD in the first place. It probably needs to be a really well done HRCT with the inspiratory expiratory cuts. And some, in some of these patients, if it's you know going to be a if it's going to be a careful discussion, you may get another CT scan even if they've recently had one. And yeah. the second point is how important it is to have, um, if possible, uh, a radiologist with thoracic training or at least body training, um, someone who's comfortable and um, adept at reading lung CT. Yeah, um, I'll absolutely agree, especially you know with your first point. If you're looking at a routine CT, looking at a PE protocol CT that was done in the ER or something like that, a lot of times you can make the initial diagnosis, right? You can establish, yes, there's fibrosis, uh, yes or no, and probably in some cases even what pattern it's in uh, in a lot of those. But even if you can do that, and you can't in all cases because there's certainly some overlap, is this true fibrosis or just some atelectasis, but then you end up on follow-up with a difficult question too. Has there been progression, yes or no? And if you don't have equivalent techniques to compare apples to apples on follow-up, then that can make the radiologist's job essentially impossible, right? If you've got relatively minor uh, possible progression and you did a PE protocol and that's where you're comparing to a baseline, you may not be able to tell. Uh, realistically whether or not there's been progression or not. So I'd agree uh, and a high quality, you know, well-performed HRCT is important uh, for that baseline study and then for follow-up as well. Uh, I just had a quick question. This is based off the previous ILD discussion that happened just before lunch. They had mentioned about repeating the serology workup. At what point, uh, and so if this was a female patient and was like 55 years old and stuff, would you, and this was like a, not a probable or not an alternative as well, but like indeterminate, would that be the situation or the classic patient where you would repeat the serology? And if yes, what's your usual uh, expert opinion on repeating the serologies in these patients? I think that's a great question. Um, you know, when we do the initial workup, we get the serologies, it all really depends on what your differential diagnosis are or what the suspicion is for, right? Like in a patient, in a white, older Caucasian male who doesn't have any symptoms of autoimmune condition, um, it really, there is, well, there's no data to support repeating serologies unless the patient is manifesting with the new symptom that you're really worried about, right? In a, in a female patient um, who maybe has had some baseline symptoms or nonspecific symptoms which didn't quite fit her into an ACR diagnosis of an autoimmune condition or initial serologies were negative, um, if you have a high enough suspicion or if she develops new symptoms, um, I think there would be a role to repeat serologies. There's no guidelines or data, for that matter, to support a timing of this. It's more of a clinical judgment. Um, do any of you have any other opinion on that? I'd have a similar recommendation with the addition that um, there might be some, even an older man, who there, the serology that you did today might have some s subtle abnormalities such that it makes you a bit more suspicious about him than you would be um, about, about someone with normal uh, panel. And then, so that might be someone you can repeat in a couple of years or something, but, but uh, yeah, otherwise, yeah. It's, it, otherwise it's the patient that's gonna make you suspicious or a new symptom. Right, yeah. I've had a few, sorry. I've had a few instances where, you know, um, the patients have been on steroids, for example, for long term, and then they come to us for evaluation. Um, and because there's not enough evidence, we stop the serology, uh, stop the corticosteroids, and then um, while we're doing the rest of the workup, maybe repeat serologies, and sometimes that can be positive. But there have been few instances of that. Tracy, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think the other case to do that is when patients aren't following the usual pathways. So patients who are just really slow progressors, they don't seem to be following the usual path that IPF patients do. Sometimes then we'll repeat serologies um, and find connective tissue disease. Yeah. All right, so going back to our patient here, um, as we talked about, you know, in a patient who has probable UIP, about 80% chance that the histopathology will show um, UIP. Um, you know, this, is, this biopsy is not from this patient. It is an example of a UIP. Um, Tracy, do you want to describe the slide for us? So um, yeah, this is a classic UIP pattern, so I'm not a pathologist, I'm a pulmonologist, so bear with me, but there is 
um, the temporal heterogeneity here that we expect with UIP. So you've got microscopic honeycomb change, you've got old fibrosis, there's some um, alveoli that look like they're probably mostly normal. This looks a little thick, but maybe some normal here, maybe here. And then you've got multiple examples of fibroblastic foci or new fibrosis. Um, in this biopsy. So there's no granulomas, there's no inflammation. You've got all the um, elements of um, temporal heterogeneity here. So this would be a subpleural in nature. So this would be a UIP biopsy. Thank you. All right. Um, so my next question for you for this patient is what would you do next? You've diagnosed this patient with IPF. Uh, would you A, wait and watch with BFT monitoring? Start antifibrotic therapy, either perfinidone or nintadenib. Refer to pulmonary rehabilitation. Consider anti-reflux regimen. Obtain genetic testing. There could be more than one answers that are right. Um, this is all set up to mock what really happens um, in each of our institutions and so that we can have more discussions. And the poll is open now. Forty-six percent said start antifibrotic therapy. Dr. Dilling, what's your thought on that? Well, it is, so this is a patient we've characterized as idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, as opposed to some other form of fibrotic lung disease. And um, so, at this point, the ATS guidelines would um, counsel us with a conditional recommendation to treat with an antifibrotic uh, medication. Um, the conditional, of course, means that. Um, there are some patients who, after a careful discussion and presentation as to the pluses and minuses of therapy, um, would would choose to not pursue therapy. So it, it really does have to become a patient discussion, but the, the basic recommendation would be to recommend therapy. Yes, so, um, you know, there has been multiple studies which have shown that even starting antifibrotic therapy, even when the patient has preserved lung function or FEC is greater than 80%, which technically would be under the normal range, or they have very mild symptoms to discuss the antifibrotic therapies with the patient. It is a shared decision-making process, but you know we have to remember that these medications only slow down disease progression. They're not curative. So every um, percent of lung function lost is never gained back. And so um, our best efforts should be towards talking to the patient about the medications that we have available and um, trying every effort to start them on therapy earlier than later. It's probably worth just talking about A as well, meaning the, 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 the alternative here, which, because uh, so, there's some, I think some hesitance sometimes to initiate therapy or recommend therapy and do a watchful waiting. And I, I always hearken back to um, something one of my mentors taught me a long time ago about caring for patients with IPF, which is to, with regard to the disease, um, how it's going to um, go forward, today's the best day of the rest of their lives. And I, it, it's almost certain that there will be progression of disease over time. And I sort of feel like I'd rather try to preserve their function and um, lung function and, and physical function the way it is today, rather than a watchful waiting and, and start and trying to preserve something down the line that's a little bit worse than what it is today. Absolutely. Um, another thing I want to comment on is genetic testing. I mean, a lot of sessions here um, have addressed or talked about short telomere and what that means to, um, you know, as either like for prognostication or treatment responses. Dr. Sholand, is that, what's your practice on obtaining genetic testing? So it's a great question and it, I think it's vi highly variable depending on your local environment and what resources you have available to you. But my practice uh, when I suspect that there's a family history is, to, is my, you know, alert goes up. We've talked about this, you've heard this many times in this conference that patients with family histories and patients with short telomeres have a, a more rapid progression and are, have a worse prognosis. So I want to make sure that I'm doing everything I can. Um, I, I think it's best done in the setting of a genetic counselor if that's, if that's possible, if you have one in your area to work with so that people can understand the implications of finding a genetic disease and what that means for them and for their family members. Um, and then um, I, and I do have that access, so we use a genetic counselor who will come in and talk to the families about what this means and then we do order the telomeres and understand who has short telomeres and um, 
do uh, genetic testing on these patients when we can. So that, I think, is the ideal perfect, perfect setting. I think absent that ability to have genetic counseling, you know, um, I think finding a resource of genetic information for the patient, getting a sense of what they and their family want to know is a very important thing. And then I think being able to get that, those telomeres measured is, it can be valuable, at least if nothing else for prognostication for them. Absolutely. And, and there, there, it, it may be a little hard to figure out or sort out at your local place, but um, for example, we, we didn't have a genetic counselor for our department of uh, our pulmonary, but we talked to our folks in our oncology um, exactly. division and we started to use their, um, their, their genetic counseling team. And uh, they, they offer not only the counseling, but they, they're very helpful in arranging and making sure that there will be coverage for the genetic for the genetic tests that are, um, you know, can be very expensive. So, I think I think it's worth doing it the right way rather than trying to do it yourself. And in the era of telehealth, there's also probably some resources that you might have in your region to be able to have genetic counseling done by telehealth as well. So you, you may have to look into it to figure out what exactly this means for you. All right, um, with the interest of time, we'll move on to the next case. But before that, do you all have any questions about, um, about this patient? This is Ray here. This here. <laughs> That's where the question came from about genetic <coughs> testing. So um, gray hair, liver dysfunction can be signs that could support this. And um, if able, it would be helpful to um, get the telomere testing done. It's a question I ask of all my ILD evaluations. For that, for that reason, exactly, yeah. Early grain, Early grain. Not, grain. not ever Early grain, grain her, yeah. Early grain. Good pickup, though. That was, yeah. <laughs> All right, so moving on to case two. We have a 68-year-old Caucasian male who initially had some non-productive cough for about a year, has progressively worsened, um, has dyspnea with severe exertion, which was noted about six months ago, still remains fairly active, playing, you know, table tennis and biking. Um, a CT chest was done by his physician, which is concerning for pulmonary fibrosis and has, was hands referred to our ILD center. The patient denied any reflux symptoms, joint pain or skin rashes, um, no chest pain, again, and no symptoms that were supportive of an autoimmune condition. Histories, um, just restless leg syndrome, not, no surgeries uh, on medication for that, has been a never smoker no alcohol or drug use, um, no family history of pulmonary disease, did work as an electrician and had some asbestos exposure, but um, nothing other than that. Um, does do some woodwork as a hobby. Um, no mold or mildew that the patient knew of, no feather bedding, no pet birds, and no other medications. On exam, it's saturating well. Um, just basically, again, had some bilateral um, dry crackles, um, no squeaks, no other findings on exam. FEC um, was 56%, um, TLC of 36%, and DLC of 55%. No exertional hypoxemia on six-minute walk test at that initial evaluation. And we have a CT here. So let's take a look, another HRCT on inspiration to start us off. So I think already we've answered at least the question of pulmonary fibrosis, yes or no, and there's clearly fibrosis with areas of articulation and distortion in these areas. There's traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis fairly significantly. But there's also in these areas a fair amount of ground glass abnormality, and on top of that reticulation, there's no definite honeycomb cyst formation either. So as we scroll through, oops. Try that again. So as you scroll through, you notice in the craniocaudal plane, unlike that other case, it's a pretty diffuse abnormality. There's a lot of upper lung predominant uh, involvement here in addition to the lower lung involvement as well. And in these areas, these peripheral areas here, uh, you get that ground glass abnormality and even some thicker consolidation in some of those areas too. Uh, 
So this, just based off the inspiratory here, is a little bit difficult for me personally, right? Uh, because it doesn't scream a specific diagnosis, which makes it very unsatisfying as a radiologist. I like to look at something and be like, oh, this is classic uh, X, Y, Z. So when you see a case like this as a radiologist, you're probably in that indeterminate pattern, i.e., it's something, but I don't know exactly what it is, which is uh, fairly unsatisfying. Like uh, all good HRCTs, we've also included some expiratories. Maybe if we see a lot of air trapping on expiration, then that'll point us in, you know, uh, towards that direction. But as we go through, we're really not seeing a lot of air trapping here either. So really, we've got fairly substantial pulmonary fibrosis here, relatively diffuse, lots of reticulation, but lots of ground glass and even some consolidation as well. There's traction bronchiectasis and bronchiolectasis, no honeycomb cyst formation. That's the giant list of keywords, right, that are going in the report. Impression, I don't know what it is, right, i.e., it's an indeterminate pattern, whatever that means. So indeterminate pattern for uh, UIP, right, is also an indeterminate pattern for HP. So inhalational injuries are certainly a consideration. HP is a consideration. Sarcoids in the differential for something like this. Uh, connective tissue disease, drug toxicity, kind of uh, the smorgasbord uh, of options for this. So as an imager, I'm unsatisfied, right, because I don't feel like I've been particularly helpful. I've answered the most basic question, do you have pulmonary fibrosis, yes or no, but I haven't really uh, pointed you in a better direction. So we had that CT scan, and then, um, as I discussed earlier, we did um, serologies as well. Um, his NXP2 on his myositis panel was 25, which is mildly elevated, but everything else was negative. So my first question would be, what would you do next? Would you do serum antibody testing for avian proteins? Would you do a bronchoscopy with lavage and um, a genomic classifier testing? Refer to rheumatology, would you get a surgical lung biopsy or start corticosteroids? And the poll is now open. All right, so bronchoscopy with lavage and genomic classifier. Dr. Sholin, can you tell us, um, and that is the right answer, um, could you tell us a little bit about you know, why this step would be the next best step? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, I think this is a, I see surgical lung biopsy is close behind, and I think this is a, you know, a really good conversation that I think you could go more than one way. Would you agree with that, Dr. Dilling? I mean, oh, sure, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm not sure right or wrong, but but just knowing your options. And this is where, you know, shared decision making, I think, comes into play a little bit. I mean, um, with the patient as far as understanding what the different procedures entail and what they might want to do. But, you know, do, pursuing the bronchoscopy and the genomic classifier is a great option for patients. It's certainly less invasive than a surgical lung biopsy. It can be done quickly and can give you an answer and kind of do a rule in um, for UIP and IPF in an earlier uh, set situation in a patient like this in whom you have really no clues as far as what's going on from the, your history, I would say. So the genomic classifier, is, is, as you may well know, is, is um, you know, uses a transcriptome and has a as machine learned transcriptome of 190 genes that can tell us with 91% specificity that a patient has a UIP pattern. And so getting a positive UIP result on that Invisia classifier can really help you lock in your diagnosis and, and avoid a more um, invasive procedure. The BAL um, I didn't touch on is uh, comes uh, comes in handy when you're thinking that hypersensitivity is on your um, differential, and as you may know from the most recent hypersensitivity guidelines, both the ATS and the CHESS guidelines suggest that a BAL can be helpful in the right clinical context to add information to your clinical and radiographic information and finding a lymphocytosis probably around 30 percentish is, is a helpful in, in helping you uh, consider the diagnosis of hypersensitivity. So doing that one procedure and getting those two results can really further your understanding of what's going on with this patient. That's right. 
Um, what is your practice about um, antibody testing for avian proteins, Dr. Dilling? The guidelines did touch a little bit on that. Yeah, so you can sometimes send off a panel of precipitins to look for what might be um, uh, the, the antigen that is leading to an HP. Um, I, I find them to be confusing often. Um, I think they, la they certainly lack uh, both specificity and sensitivity. Uh, in, in, in other words, different regions of the country or around the world are going to have different antigens that might be suspicious. So um, y if you're going to have a good panel, it really would need to be something that's more locally designed. But they're never going to be complete, so there's always going to be things missing there. And then uh, I always, I'm always curious as to whether if it is positive, and often they come to me with the panel having been done already, I usually don't order them, but um, I, I find myself wondering if that antigen that was positive there is really something to be worried, uh, is, is to blame anyway. I mean, they might have a, a, a positive test first and, and not have hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So I, f I find them confusing. Yeah, I think um, we have a similar practice as well. Um, so for the other, um, you know, referring to rheumatology, I don't, you know, that's necessarily not a wrong thing to do. This patient does have an XP um, test that is positive, but what does that truly mean? It is mildly positive. Um, oftentimes, you know, as with, with aging, several of these serologies do come back positive um, and may not necessarily um, be contributing to the path underlying pathology. Um, you know, in fact, um, we had looked at um, one of the large, the SN trial for IPF that was done, and um, more than half the patients there um, were positive for ANA. What does that really mean? You know, we don't quite know, don't quite understand. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, we could here get rheumatology to weigh in. This patient did not really have any signs or symptoms that, um, that were um, suggesting that this could be an autoimmune condition. Now, if this were to be like a 35-year-old female, yes, rheumatology would be on board right, right away. So you have to take into context the demographics as well. Um, and then when it comes to starting corticosteroids, we don't really know what we are treating here, right? We don't know what the underlying diagnosis is. So um, generally, there's no recommendation to start corticosteroids at this stage um, of your workup for the patient. Um, since we mentioned about HP, I thought I would throw this out there. So, for example, you do a BAL in this study. The BAL comes back 25%. We're going to start them on uh, OFEV regardless, uh, but would that make you your suspicion strong enough despite having no uh, air trapping on expiratory films or any uh, triggers? Would you start prednisone A? and then, Or would you want a cryobiopsy and want evidence of granuloma to sort of more likely confirm your HP-associated fibrosis diagnosis before you decide on that? Yeah, I think that's a great question, but there's two parts to your question, really. The first, you know, comment about the adding nintadana, but I don't think we have enough. The guidelines don't quite recommend starting nintadana right at the diagnosis, so we'll get to that um, a little bit later in the discussion of this case. But um, when it comes to what evidence we have from BAL um, lymphocytosis, Dr. Sholand, what are your thoughts on that? So I think it's a great question that drives us back to those guidelines that we know from uh, on hypersensitivity diagnosis, hypersensitivity uh, diagnosis that came from both ATS and CHESS this year. And the BAL lymphocytosis, um, without a, the right clinical context and without the right classic CT scan does not make the diagnosis of hypersensitivity. So, you know, it, it, it heightens your index of suspicion, you, but we do need more, as you sort of alluded to. So I, I agree that we have to keep pushing forward with that uh, finding on a BAL. Yeah, it's going to be someone who needs more testing. I, uh, by the way, I'd probably also be, if, we're get, if, if I'm starting to get curious about HP because of some clue like you're talking about, I'm going to once again, try to talk to the patient. I'm going to dive mm -hmm. into information in their history a little more, like this woodworking thing, which kinds of wood, and kind of try and figure some of that out. And, and even an electrician, they're, you know, maybe that's not by itself an exposure, but they're probably going to be doing some projects that may put them in, in harm's way with regard to molds and things. So um, things to think about and, and investigate. But he probably needs more testing. A biopsy of some sort is like you, mm -hmm. like you alluded to. Why do we not call this case as a case of IPAF? Because it looks like he has a positive antibody, so he has the serologic domain. Mm 
and he has the radiology of ILD without another explanation? Um, that's a great question. I'm not sure that sero that weak positive is enough to make the serologic domain. I, I, so that's probably why. <laughs> um, so yeah. there's three domains that you want to look at, right? The physical exam really had no signs um, that were supportive of an autoimmune condition. The radiologic domain, um, you mostly are looking for ground glass or nonspecific interstitial pneumonia pattern or um, organizing pneumonia pattern, which really this is more of an indeterminate pattern. So it's not quite fitting into the IPAF criteria just yet. And the other thing to remember, and you know this about IPAV, it's a, it's a sort of a research definition, so it's a little bit hard to take that into clinical practice and know what to do with. But it's a really good question because it comes up a lot, doesn't it? We get these, as she mentioned, you know, positive serologies are rampant in this business, right? So what do we do with those? That's, that's a challenge. And another thing I want to also point out is, you know, we did an extended serological panel on this patient. When you look at the guidelines, um, the, the main recommendation is to get a limited serological panel with ANA, um, RF, CCPs, you know, SCL, SSA. Um, but when they asked the whole panel, majority of them still felt like in their centers they were doing a full serological panel, including my status panel. And that's what we do at our center, too. I don't know if that differs you do, but in majority of our patients with ILD, we get a full extended serological panel, which probably has contributed to us finding more of these positive serologies as well. Just a quick question. I know we probably have more case to get to, but so our genomic classifier that we said we're going to do comes back as UIP. What's the diagnosis now? So I, the, the only reason I bring it up is I don't know that this is clearly IPF, uh, based on what radiology has already told us, this could be sarcoid, HP. Sarcoid can be UIP, HP can be UIP, IPF can be UIP. So I don't think we've gotten any closer to a diagnosis with the invisia in this I, case. I mean, I think that's a great point. We, UIP does not equal IPF, so we still have to put it in the clinical context. So I don't know yet, right? Thank right. You. I and guess I we go back and ask. Do what Dr. Dilling would do. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Always that's do what where... Dr. Dilling would do. That's... <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the guidelines, you know, uh, the recommendations on the guidelines came in, right? There's, there's high specificity but not sensitivity. Like, could this UIP be related to a fibrotic HP or RAILD? The, and that's one of the limitations that we still need to understand with the genomic classifier, what does this UIP mean in the big picture? Oh. Now, in a patient who would be a very high risk for a surgical lung biopsy, maybe we could take that information and try to um, see if we can discuss as a group and come up with a diagnosis. But you know, if you could potentially go to a surgical lung biopsy, then you know, but we'll would probably get UIP that. on the surgical lung biopsy. So same, same. You arrive. I mean, it, the, the answer in reverse. If you got UIP on the surgical lung biopsy, what's the diagnosis, right? So. That's, that's. Yeah, yeah. The, in the absence of granulomas and everything else, then, then you're right. Same so, conundrum, exactly. Yeah. But, but, our, but our alert goes up. It's UIP. We know UIP is the worst pattern, right? That's gonna, that person's going to progress more quickly. So, you know, do we follow more closely? Do, are we more aggressive about anti-fibrotics? You know, things of that nature. I mean, I think there's still some exactly. information there, but I appreciate that we wouldn't seal the diagnosis. So with this patient, we got a BAL. It only showed 10% lymphocytes, and um, the genomic classifier was non-UIP. So what would you do next? Surgical lung biopsy, start antifibrotic therapy, start corticosteroids or other immunosuppression. We may have already discussed a lot of this. All right, that would be right. So we did do a surgical lung biopsy, and um, our pathologist is here now, Dr. Gonzalez, and we will discuss what we saw there. Hello, everyone. First of all, I'm sorry I'm late. <laughs> Just drove from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, so in the right upper lobe, we have um, fibrosis for sure. And uh, we, can, we can see that we have a fibrosis that is subpleural and paraseptal. Uh, but we can also uh, appreciate um, there is uh, some airway center fibrosis. Just use. Um, the mouse? Yeah. That doesn't work. Um, 
Okay, and here, so here, here's the paraceptal region, uh, and here's the subpleural region, and we can see that there is thickening in those areas, but we also have airway-centered fibrosis. Uh, there are areas that appear uh, with less involvement or uh, possibly uninvolved, uh, and there is sharp demarcation in those areas, as we can see uh, with UIP pattern often. Um, we have a uh, lining here by low cuboidal cells that if we looked at it higher power right now, we, we could see that that is, in fact, a honeycomb change. There are some uh, lymphoid aggregates that we not so uncommonly see um, close to areas the, of uh, honeycomb change. Uh, now, if we look closer uh, at, at the fibrosis, we have these um, foci of fibroblasts with myxoid stroma, so they're fibroblastic foci or active fibrosis. Um, we have these uh, lymphoid aggregates. Um, this one is uh, in a subplural or in a plural location. Um, it's kind of hard to say uh, the majority of cells are lymphocytes or plasma cells, but we know that these guys over here are predominantly plasma cells because they have eccentric nuclei, and this one particularly has a perinuclear half which corresponds with the Golgi apparatus. Uh, now, in a different area of this biopsy, we have these multinucleated giant cells uh, surrounded by lymphocytes, and there are at least three multinucleated giant cells, so that is a, indeed a, a poorly formed granuloma. And this was located um, in the periphery of an airway. Uh, and even here in this photo, we can start seeing uh, some fibroblastic fo uh, active fibrosis uh, going on. These are the less involved areas, or... Um, uh, a low power, that the areas that look like there was um, sparing, uh, and there is collagen deposition in these alveolar walls. Um, here we see that there is inflammation around some airways. So, um, well, the, should I summarize? In summary, for the pathology component, uh, we have um, Findings, we know now that because there is a poorly formed granuloma, this is at least indeterminate UIP. Um, I would go as far as saying unlikely to be UIP um, following the guidelines. Um, now, if we applied the guidelines for uh, fibrotic HP, uh, I will um, I see that the question... It's okay. I think we've already kind of gone through some of the, um, see if they're listening. So, <laughs> so if, if we apply, I see we're also running out of time. Uh, if we apply the criteria for fibrotic HP, um, we cannot call it fibrotic HP because of the lymphoid aggregate that appeared to have uh, a majority of plasma cells, or a lot of the cells on the side were plasma cells, even though it was not a, a secondary follicle. Thank you. All right, so what is your diagnosis? I think I still have to go through this part, so if you want to answer that for me. But I know we've discussed or touched based on a lot of these, um, a lot of this question a little bit already. All right. Okay. Dr. Sholan, what do you think about option B, um, IPAF here? with the description that we had from the biopsy and the clinical findings. Well, I mean, I think you put a shadow of the doubt in there, right? I mean, <laughs> so you didn't make it clear that it was fib fibrotic HP. So, I mean, I think, I think we'd have to discuss it in a multidisciplinary conference and talk about what we thought the clinical features were and if we thought that met criteria um, and try to decide where we land on it because it has features really of fibrotic HP except for that one exception, right? So, so this would be... Yeah. This would be classified as a probable fibrotic HP uh, in the presence of the lymphoid aggregates. Right. You know, and that, that antibody, which was low titer, NX2, is like associated with dermatomyositis, and mm -hmm. there's no evidence of skin findings. We don't have myositis. We don't have symptomatic myositis at all. Like, I think I'm more apt to dismiss it as, um, as, as a red herring rather than to try and... Um, uh, create this diagnosis with it. Yes, and that's really what we agreed upon. And, you know, after much discussion, um, we um, felt like he had some exposures and then the granulomas that we saw in the CT, 
um, the demographics, lack of any CDD symptoms um, to really call it fibrotic HP. Um, and also then we went back and asked him more questions. I mean, of course, there was the woodwork, but he was, you know, really doing it in his garage, wearing a mask while he was using doing that. But he did get a professional assessment of his house done, and they found a lot of mold in his AC duct. And so that's another, you know, thing I want to focus on is if there is a high suspicion for HP, to go back, ask your patient more questions, maybe in some patients even get professional assessment of their house um, or workplace, or even ask questions about, you know, they, they not, there may not be any exposures in their house or workplace, but maybe they visit their son's house a lot and there's mold there. So trying to ask these questions would be really important. So in our patient, um, you know, within all of this workup time, his FVC did decline to 49%, um, and he was now requiring two liters of oxygen with exertion. Um, so, um, you know, the question really was, you know, how would you manage this patient? And this decline was seen right after he, he came to see us in clinic, um, you know, after his uh, biopsy. So would you start prednisone? Would you do azathioprine or mycophenolate, plus or minus prednisone? Would you start an antidemic per protocol, start perfenidone, or you would continue to monitor? All right, an antidemic protocol. All right, let's talk a little bit about that. So with the new guidelines, um, we also now have a new term, progressive pulmonary fibrosis, which was, you know, called PFILD and other terms prior to the guidelines. Um, really what, how they are defined is by physiological um, or patient symptoms. So if the patient has increased dyspnea or there's physiological findings, which is really um, FEC decline of greater than, absolute FCC decline of greater than 5% over a one-year time period, or a greater than 10% decline of DLCO um, corrected for hemoglobin over a one-year period. Or if you see increased um, findings on CT scan, or there's disease progression on CT scan defined by increased honeycomb changes, increased traction bronchiectases, um, increased reticulations, or increase in the coarseness of the reticulations, um, Basically, you know, that would all fit into the criteria of progressive pulmonary fibrosis. Um, and that's really, you know, where this patient is quite fitting into that diagnosis. But Dr. Sholand, what would your approach be to uh, treatment here? Well, I think, I mean, I'm trying to remember, sorry, that the, he had shown progression between the two or he had not? He had. Yeah. So I think it's not, I think it's appropriate to use the Nintendo. I think that, the, I'm sure you meant to put that, or maybe not to confuse things, but of course the first thing is remove the antigen. So, uh, you know. <laughs> of course. You know, right, so that, I mean, we, that we should, it, it goes without saying, but we should say it, right? So, yeah, and then I think it's appropriate to use the, the Nintendo. I think you could consider immunosuppression uh, depending on how, you, you know, how he, can, how he does once the antigen is removed. Dr. Well. Dilling, what is your approach when, you know, when, HP, when you see a patient with HP, of course, after removing the antigen, um, you know, what are the instances where you consider either corticosteroids or immunosuppression versus antifibrotic therapy? Yeah, this is actually, so this is a great discussion point because I, I think even people that do a lot of ILD work like we do, I think are going to behave differently. And, and, and so I think I'm going to start immunosuppression here. This is... Uh, he's a fresh case. He, you know, may have some response. There's some even pathologic findings that look like they may have, you know, some some ability to respond as well. There's definitely scar, whether it's radiographic scar, whether it's um, on the pathology. So, so and progression of fibrosis. So I think both answers are acceptable. I, I would just, I'd probably start with some immunosuppression and then layer in um, antifibrotic later. Yeah, actually, that, that's an excellent point. We actually started them on both. Um, you know, we looked at the biopsy. I mean, there are elements of inflammation there, um, but at the same time, the patient has progressive disease. There is fibrosis, and um, this was a gentleman who was not on any medications, had a fairly good, um, you know, he was not frail, um, you know, 
he didn't quite have the um, features which I would be really worried about starting two different medications which can have, um, have multiple side effects. And so we opted to do that. Um, unfortunately, he um, actually continued to have progressive disease and um, he got a lung transplant. But um, you know, when, you, when we think about HB, can you tell us a little bit about cellular HB and fibrotic HB and how this um, classification has come to? Me or Dr. Dillon? Uh, Dr. Dillon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you may. <laughs> I feel like I'm uh, So cellular HP is, is generally a bit more like the acute uh, phenomenon, whereas uh, the chronic HP um, is, is kind of a, a later phenomenon. So uh, uh, immunosuppression probably in the acute phase, and I'm, that's why I'm, he's a fresh case. He's still just out of the antigen when we see some inflammatory findings. So I, I think he may respond to immunosuppression. Yeah, yeah, and I think exactly. And I, but I think, I think that, you know, too, that to understand that the, it, the guidelines, both guidelines have, are steered us to using new terminology. We use the term cellular and fibrotic now uh, and, and replace that from acute and subacute and, chron and, chron and chronic, so understanding whether we think it's a more inflammatory or more fibrotic process, you know, and I think talking, again, talking to your pathologist and saying, you know, is there, was there a lot of, was it, would you call this a cellular, would you call this a fibrotic, what would you call this, you know, to help drive your decisions, how aggressive you'll be with immunosuppression, you know, in your case, I think you felt there was a fair amount of cellular component such that you would think immunosuppression would be a successful agent, but, um, really sort of our understanding has evolved to think that these HPs fall into two different categories. Um, yeah, and I think, I mean, I think this is, a, we talked about this, this is where there's a lot of dif difference in how we might approach these uh, shared decision making with patients, but, you know, again, I think removing the inciting antigen as, as much as possible is probably one, two, and three, and that's where the most data comes in the of successful therapy, so. It's hard, and that's hard to do, right? I mean, he has to, what, how to get that out of his air conditioning? Do we ever successfully remove it? Is that why he progressed? I mean, that, you know, it's hard to say, right? I'm not. He did get a cleaning done. Yeah. Now, how successful right, that was, Right, but if he went back sure, and it did yeah. counts, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's a really, it's a really hard job for us, these hypersensitivities. And, and you're, even if we found something like we did here, you can't be 100% certain that that was the exposure still. I mean, there could be something else in his life elsewhere, or, um, or, or like in a workplace or something. Yeah, that's a great point. Yep. Yeah, no, this is great. I really enjoy this discussion. Just to, I mean, because I'm thinking about it more how I would have approached this case and I would have probably done the same thing. But just curious with regard to what our pathology uh, colleague mentioned with the inflammation. And I'm just thinking out loud here, would it be appropriate or would you guys consider giving him a short course of prednisone since he's that symptomatic and developing oxygen? and then transitioning him to the MMF and the Nintendib while his, uh, because MMF will take about a few months for it to kick in and actually work and stuff. Would that be an appropriate uh, cause, like a route to do go in this case, especially with the cellularity that we saw? I'm glad you asked. Yeah, I think I would do that. Yeah. Yep. Um, we're actually um, top of the hour. We did have another um, case to discuss, but I think we'll end the session with this. Thank you for your great participation because that really was needed for this session to be successful. So thank you for your participation and being here um, on this Wednesday afternoon. Yeah, come thank back you. next year for the third case, right? Yes, <laughs> third case in Hawaii. <laughs> uh,